So we've seen how we can encode with LZW. Uh, and a compression method is only really useful if we can also decode it. I told you how to zip, now we would also like to unzip. The challenge at that point is that the encoder uh, kept this dictionary growing at each step we added a new code word and a new phrase. And we have to do the same thing in the decoder if we will, if we uh, want any chance to decode the same string. So we have to do the same as before, um, but uh, from the decoder's perspective. And here, so remember what the encoder did. It, uh, when it coded X, it stored X, but then it added XC to the dictionary. Now, uh, for the decoder, we can remember what X was, the previous thing, but we don't know what C is before we have decoded the next phrase. So, uh, what we do is, um, we've, we try to first uh, decode the next phrase, which is uh, called Y. So, that's the, the next phrase that occurs in in the coded text, so that's a code word, and we will have that in the dictionary somewhere, so we know what it expands to. We do that first, and then uh, we'll add xc to the dictionary. Because once we have decoded y, we know that xc, um, we know what c is, so we can add xc to the dictionary. Also note that uh, this means the decoder is always lagging one step behind in the following sense. Uh, we only start adding to the dictionary after we have decoded the second substring of S. We need X and we need Y before we can add XC to the dictionary. Let's again uh, see an example how this goes. So here's, here's our coded text which is just a sequence of numbers. Now we follow the same convention. This is of course important. We have to decide what our alphabet is. So here again, um, the, the source alphabet is all ASCII characters. And we start with our dictionary filled by all those characters, uh, same as we had it in the last example. Now decoding works uh, uh, well, we, we'll, decoding works by keeping in, in mind what the last decoded phrase was, but to get started, that's empty. Then we decode the next thing, and then we add xc, the previous phrase, plus the first character of the newly decoded phrase to the dictionary. So let's, let's see how this goes. We start with the first code word, and we find what that decodes to. That's a C, so we put the C here. Now, in the first step, we cannot add to the dictionary because we don't have the C yet. We don't have the X yet. Uh, but now in the next step, X is the previously decoded phrase, that's just the C. Y is the newly decoded phrase, that's A. And what we add to the dictionary is X followed by the first character of Y. Well, in that case, that's just CA, right? Y is just a single character. And that means we add a new code to the dictionary with CA as its meaning. Uh, the computerized version of that would not store this string, but it would store a reference to this and then add the single letter A. But that's not as important. We can uh, stick to the human version. One more step, we decode the next phrase, which is another single character. We remembered that this was our previous phrase we decoded. This is the new phrase we decoded. So we add an x followed by the first character of y to the dictionary. Now we decode a space and we do the same thing. Last thing plus the space added to the dictionary. One more time with the b. Uh, nothing really interesting happens. 
uh, pretty much the same thing. Now comes the first interesting case where uh, what we decode is something that we previously added to the dictionary. So we find that 129 is an, and that's something we only know because we replayed the same changes to the dictionary that the encoder had done. And uh, well, now we take the previous, the previous phrase was just b, and the next phrase is this. So we take the previous plus the first character of the next phrase and add that to the dictionary. And we keep going happily like this until, oops, we have 133 as the thing we want to decode, but we don't know what that is yet. We don't have it in the dictionary. There's no entry in the dictionary, but it also would be the code that we would have to fill next. So that's a, a special tricky situation that seems, um, that seems to require, uh, uh, that seems to bring us into a deadlock, right? We, we should decode the same code word that we're currently trying to fill in the dictionary. How should that be possible? So do we have a problem with that code? It turns out uh, you can figure this out and nothing's wrong with the code, but you have to look at it very closely. The problem again in this example was we wanted to decode something that's not yet in the dictionary. And the reason how this can happen if, well, I mean, this is a valid output of the encoder. It's not that we made a mistake in encoding. This can only happen then because the decoder is lagging one step behind in creating its dictionary. So. It can only occur if we want to use exactly the code that we were just about to fill in the dictionary. That's the only situation where this can happen. And if that's the case, we actually know what's going on. We know uh, how this case arised and we can solve it. And for that, we have to look, we have to roll back time and look what the encoder has done at that stage and then we can learn from that what we have to do in the decoder now. So the situation is we're trying to decode k in the step that will add k to the dictionary. We know the last phrase x, and we'd like to know the next phrase, which is the thing that x decodes to. But we also know uh, in the encoder, we, we encoded x, but then added xc to the dictionary. So really the meaning of dk must be x followed by c. Now that's good because we know x. That's the last phrase that we decoded. So we already, also in the decoder, we know what x is. The problem is that we don't know what c is, or it seems that we don't know what c is. Now, uh, if, if we look at what um, what the encoder would have done, it encodes x, then it adds xc, the next character that's followed, and that happens to be the thing that's in, in the dictionary for the next phrase. That means that this, the x plus the next character must be the same as this next phrase. That's what this situation says. Once again, we're, um, we're trying to decode y. <laughs> I think that c is, is wrong here. We're trying to decode y, which is, is this area, and that's a phrase in the dictionary. We know that phrase has just been added in the encoder. After it encoded x, it added xc, and that was the same thing as xc, otherwise, we wouldn't see that same k now again. And that means, by just following these green arrows, it means that y is really x followed by, well, this, uh, this first character of x, because that's the, the first character of x projected down here again. So even though it seems at first we don't know c, 
In this specific case, we can figure out that c really must be the first character of x. I know this is a, this is a tricky argument. Um, I will show you the code that actually implements what comes out of this. And the code is very, very, very simple. But it doesn't really explain why this works. Uh, the best way to explain this really is, is in this picture, playing back what the encoder has done and what that has to mean for uh, this specific string. This can only happen if the string has a specific pattern. So the code for decoding, as I said, is, is, not, is not very complicated, even though it has this uh, tricky case that it has to look at. Um, as before, we will have a dictionary. This time, it stores a mapping from code words to strings. In the encoding, it was a try that stored a mapping from strings to code words. Now we have to do it backwards. We will also have the same K, which is the next unused code word. Uh, we'll keep track of the, the first code word or the, well, the, the, the next code word to read. And we'll keep track of X and Y, the phrases that we're currently looking at. That's a uh, very, same, very same notation as in the example. And S will be the output, that's the decoded string. Now for every code word in the coded text, we will uh, remember the last decoded thing, which initially is just uh, the, first, the first character, whatever the first code word decodes to. Then we read the next, we take the next uh, code word. And now this is the special case. So if the next code word that we're reading is the one that we would currently fill, the next unused code word, then we don't know yet. We don't have that entry in the dictionary. But we know it's the special case that we just discussed at length. And in that case, we can just set y to be x followed by the first character of x. That's exactly what is written here. And the picture explains uh, that situation. Otherwise, if q is, is not k, well, then it's smaller than, than k, really. And we can look, we can look up the meaning of this uh, code word in the dictionary. What's left to do is, is uh, add this decoded phrase to the output and uh, add to the dictionary the new phrase. Now, this, this is valid for, for both. That's, uh, that's our C. So we store XC in the dictionary, emulating what the encoder would have done. And then we start back again. OK. So code is fairly straightforward. It just has to distinguish these two cases. But it's, it's, it doesn't look complicated. The logic behind it is a little uh, contrived. So this is the example from before continued. Uh, we're looking at the 133. That was this line where um, we didn't know what the meaning of 133 is because we were just creating this. But we remembered that x was a n. And we're in this special case. So it's actually the one that's depicted here. So x is a n. We knew that then y has to be x followed by the first character of x again. And that's Anna. So that's what we put in here. And well, the, the 83 is, uh, again, a regular case. All right. Uh, I hope this, is, um, this has become clear how to handle this tricky situation. Once you've seen the solution, it's, it's fairly obvious um, uh, how to implement it. But coming up with this trick is definitely an, an achievement. Now to see uh, how well you understood, especially the encoding phase, I'd like to ask uh, this, this question. Um, and maybe I should explain what I mean by a phrase. So uh, let me go back to the encoding example. Uh, da -da. That's all the way back. In the encoding example, you, you saw that we stored the, uh, we stored the, the coded text really is just this list of integers. But the individual code words were representing different parts of the string. And in fact, they're just consecutive substrings of the input text. So again, this is not the full text. I should have stopped at this point. Um, well, never mind. 
So we could uh, retroactively, we could take the string and put in bars between the positions where a new phrase starts. So a phrase is whatever is encoded by a single code word. So all of these would be phrases. Now yo is the first um, non-trivial phrase consisting of more than one character. And as we keep going, there's more of those non-trivial phrases. So this is what I mean by phrases. Any string that's uh, encoded by a single code word. And this is also sometimes uh, known as parsing. So we're parsing the string into phrases using the LSAT 77 uh, decomposition of the string. All right. So that's what this question is about. And oops, now I deleted the answer mark. That was not what I wanted. Uh, let's post the question. This question is on the tougher side. Um, this is this requires actual creative thinking of you. So, if you don't figure this out, don't um, don't worry too much. This is uh, so on the one side to check some understanding. On the other side, I will abuse it to talk about the limits of how well LSAT seventy uh, LSAT W can compress. I hope the spam on the live chat stops now. I've blocked that user. I'm not sure if that was all. And uh, I hope this doesn't get this doesn't become a, a persistent issue. It's a bit annoying. Okay, seems uh, a couple of people are already done. Um, let me stop the question then um, and rather spend more time discussing it. So there's uh, a lot of different different answers and uh, not many ticked the, the right one. Uh, as I said, it, it was a trick question. It's a really tough question. Now let's see if I can undo this page deletion that I, that I did. So the right answer is, is square root of n. Um, I will briefly explain why. But the more important uh, part is, so first, first let's compare this to run length encoding. In run length encoding, we had this extreme example. If you have a bit string that's just zeros, you, you would compress it to two log n bits, roughly. Um, so we've, we've had that last time. Um, somewhere on the slides. But so if you have 0 to the n, you would roughly represent that with 2 log n bits, because you're just writing down the number n. Now it seems LSAT 77 is not quite able to be uh, as efficient. It's so well, step one, uh, part one of what I wanted to say is this type of input, a single character repeated all over, is as about, is about as good as it can get for lempel sif compression too. It's not just the best possible for uh, run length encoding, it's also the best possible input for LSAT W. Uh, and still the, the number of phrases is roughly square root of n, not uh, logarithmic, which is that's much less than square root of n. That's um, uh, remark number one. Remark number two, it's still much better than Huffman coding, which would spend at least one bit for each input character. So it would never get really below linear. Uh, so why is square root n the right answer? Uh, for that, you really have to 
have to simulate how the LZW encoding works. You will have a, an example of that uh, in the tutorials for a, a less degenerate text, so you will have um, a chance to exercise this one more time. Uh, so I will only go, go through this very briefly. Uh, we'll always encode the first character in isolation, but then we'll add AA to the dictionary. Because we always, this is X, we encode X, and then we store XC, X plus the next character, we put that in the dictionary. So when we start reading here, we find AA in the dictionary. So we can encode AA, and we encode AA and store AAA in the dictionary. So at that point, we can read AAA because that's what we just put in the dictionary and so on and so forth. So with each step, the phrase that we can encode gets one step longer. And so that means after summing up, so we have uh, the, the total length of the string that I represent is the sum of the first integers. And I have to do this so that I reach the length n. Now you can figure out this. there's a closed form for the left-hand side that you might or might not know. Um, okay, I should have written uh, not n. So the number of phrases, I don't know, let's call this p, p plus 1 divided 2 is n. And that works out to p is roughly uh, 2n, square root of 2n. Uh, it's not a uh, precise calculation, but uh, well, so this is just the, the formula by Gauss and the simple case, and uh, you, you can figure out the details. So that's where the square root n comes from. Uh, the first phrase is one character, next is two, next is three, next is four, next is five, and so on. All right, so that's about the, the limits. The best case for Lempel-Sif is somewhere between the best case for run length encoding and Huffman coding. Um, we didn't really talk about the full, so I presented Lem Lempelsiv Welsh's algorithm in the pure form. Now, uh, I initially said this LZW is a variable to fixed uh, code encoding. And we said that usually we use something like D is 12 or so, uh, a couple of bits for each code word. If you keep going with this encoding, you add a new phrase after each uh, encoded phrase. That means your dictionary keeps growing and growing. If you keep doing that, you will eventually overflow this two to the D uh, phrases. So then at that stage, uh, you have to do something so there's, there's different options what you can do if your dictionary is full. One option is you just double the size of your dictionary and make your code words one bit longer. That's actually a viable option. The other option is you just forget the dictionary and start again from scratch. Uh, that way you can limit the, the memory space. Uh, remember, you have to keep the dictionary in main memory for the encoding and decoding. So if your file is, is very, very big that you're compressing, the text is very, very long, uh, this will blow your, your main memory. So by flushing the dictionary, you can keep the memory space bounded. And so this is, this is what all practical methods do, uh, as far as I know. And if you've ever played with the tuning parameters of, of SIP and similar programs, they usually have a dictionary size that you can specify. And this is, uh, this is controlling when the dictionary is flushed. And again, well, I, sh I should say, uh, really, this version is what implementations do. Uh, they uh, don't wait for the dictionary to be full, but they have some heuristics to trigger uh, flushing the dictionary, and they reserve a, sp a specific code word to tell the the decoder, hey, sorry, I, I decided to flush the dictionary. Let's start from scratch. So this is, uh, in theory, you can just keep going with filling the dictionary as I, as I showed you in the example. Uh, a more reasonable version in practice is to limit this at some point and start from scratch. Uh, 
if you keep if you if you do that, uh, both encoding and decoding can be done in linear time. Um, this is this requires the correct data structures for the dictionary. So here we need a try for the dictionary, and here an array. If you do that, then uh, they uh, use linear time, and that's that's as fast as you can as you can go. And uh, also, if if you bound the dictionary size to be fairly small, you can do this in embedded devices. So that's why zip or variants of it can be used inside network cards um, as part of network protocols to compress the uh, the traffic that goes through your cables. It's, it's one use case, and especially Lempulsive Welsh is, is suitable for that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's um, the points I wanted to say here. So uh, Lempulsive Welsh is fast. It works in the streaming model, that's what I just said. Uh, we, can, we can do this with a limited amount of extra memory, and we can hard code it in, in hardware if we want. And at the same time, it does have significant compression for many types of data, like the silly uh, all work and no play makes check a dull boy comp copied over and over. That would very, very well compress with LZW and many other more natural types of texts would too. Uh, the only downside really is that if you use these, these limitations, then you also limit the redundancies, the repetitive redundancies you can exploit to be somewhat local. If you keep flushing your dictionary, you forget the re repetitions that are uh, far, far away, that are uh, long ago. And there seems to be no good, uh, no good solution for this uh, uh, in general. But uh, OK. Every method has their downsides. That was uh, Lempelsif Welsh, um, a standard method for compression and an important building block in the toolbox. To finish this this part, this uh, second part on, on exploiting repetitive redundancy, I'll, I'll present it a little overview of the main compression methods we've seen up to up to now. That's Huffman codes run length encoding and Lempelsif Welsh just now. Um, as I mentioned before, so Huffman codes encode a, a fixed size portion of the source to a variable size code word. And Lempelsif Welsh is the opposite. A variable size portion of the text is encoded with a fixed size code word. Run length encoding in this terminology will be variable to variable, because depending on how long the run is, the, the phrases can be arbitrarily long, and the same is true for the code words. We use this Elias Gamma code, as you will remember. Huffman codes had the, the disadvantage that you need two passes over the source. That's not true for these methods. For Huffman codes, we also have to send the dictionary alongside with the text. So we have to send the dictionary first, or the, the Huffman code, and then send the, the coded text. Uh, on the other hand, we don't have to do this for run length encoding in Lempel Sif. But um, if we're unlucky, we might still uh, expand the size because we pay we pay some overhead for the uh, well we had the the cases if the runs are length two or length six then the gamma code is actually longer than writing down the things in unary and for Lempelsif Welsh remember we start filling the the dictionary with all the letters but then we don't encode them with the seven bit ASCII code but we encoded them with the 12 bits that are needed to specify any entry in the dictionary. So that's, that's an expansion, potentially. On English text, uh, well, this is, this is a, a, a rough ballpark number, uh, roughly a 60% compression ratio for, for Huffman codes if you start with ASCII. Run length encoding is usually useless for text, but uh, Lempelsif Welsh uh, beats Huffman here substantially. And well, uh, all of them have use cases in, in different um, compression protocols. But it's probably fair to say that uh, Lempelsif Welch, to some extent, is used as is. But all three 
are mostly used as building blocks in larger pipelines as part of a, a more complicated setup.